Of course, we know the past is different from the future, but still, as my guest puts it, why can you remember yesterday but not tomorrow or turn an egg into an omelet but can't turn an omelet into an egg? Joining me with answers to his own questions and why understanding the universe matters is theoretical physicist and Caltech researcher Sean Carroll, whose most recent books include The Particle at the End of the Universe and From Eternity to Here. Sean, welcome. Thanks for having me, Peggy. Now, uh, there's nothing like trying to boil down centuries worth of research into the answer for this question, which is, what is time? Well, you know, the universe that we live in consists of all this stuff, and the stuff moves around a little bit. And time is basically the label that says which moment in the history of the universe we're at. It's like which frame of a movie or which page of a book. That's really all time is. And I understand from, from reading your work, it, it goes from organized to disorganized, and that's sort of a, a measure of time? Well, that's what makes time special. That's what makes the past different from the future. We scientists talk about entropy, the disorderliness of the universe, and the universe left to its own devices becomes more disorderly. Entropy increases, and we think that that one fact, the fact that entropy goes up and the universe becomes messier, is the total difference between the past and the future. Now, you use the example of, um, you have used the example of when you drop or scatter a deck of cards, that it never spontaneously goes the other way. It goes from organized to disorganized. This is completely distressing news to people like me who spend their <laughs> life trying to create order in, in everyday ways. Um, but there is some solace in there. There is some order in something you call uh, the arrow of time. What is that? Well, the arrow of time is just that fact that the universe has a direction in time, as opposed to in space, if you were out there in the stars, in a spacesuit, there'd be no difference between one direction or another. But in the one direction of time, we all know which direction is yesterday and which one is tomorrow. And that's kind of a mystery to scientists. We can explain how it works. We don't quite yet know why it is like that. Well, uh, this can be really heady stuff. You're making it quite simple. You've been on NOVA, the Colbert Report. You're popular on social media for making this uh, really accessible. But why should just the average person care about the Big Bang Theory, the universe, or the arrow of time? You know, when we're six years old, we all care about this stuff, right? Kids know that the universe is an interesting, fascinating, exciting place, and they ask questions. Why is it like that? And so I'm not saying that we should invent some new passion for understanding the universe. We should just remember that we do care about it. It's kind of beaten out of us when we go through high school and get jobs and things like that. I think that everyone should share in the passion of figuring out how stuff works. Well, speaking of high school, when it comes to teaching physics, many people would kind of yawn and say, well, this was terribly boring. Uh, do you think that physics in high school or science in high school should be taught differently? And if so, how? I think it should be. I'm not a, a, a real expert, and I have great respect for the teachers who do a good job, but I think there should be a lot more emphasis on the method of science, the way that we figure things out, rather than just on the facts that we get at the answers. I think that in the modern technological era, we can be able to use the internet and video games and all sorts of wonderful ways to teach people the puzzle-solving skills that make them think like scientists. Why is it important for us to think like scientists? Well, we live in a world that's governed by science, right? Uh, not only the physical world that obeys the laws of nature, but our social world, you know, our human world is extremely influenced by science now. It is the best lens we have with which to view how the world works. And I think that everyone should play a part in figuring that out. I agree with that because I particularly like it. Now, tonight you're giving a lecture at the Reuben H. Fleet uh, Science Center. How are audiences, how do they actually typically respond to your uh, lectures and to these conversations? Well, there are audiences that came to hear me, so it's a selected group, but they love it. You know, I think that there's no reason why, even if you're not a professional scientist, you can't follow along with what science is doing. I think that I want to live in a world where after work, People get off a long day at work, they go to the bar, they have a drink, and they talk about their favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. What do you think it'll take to advance this sort of uh, a beer after work talking about science or sort of make this part of the, the, the public uh, domain or conversation, sort of advancing science that way? You know, a lot of it is that we, we come across as very intimidating sometimes when we talk about science. A lot of it is that people had bad experiences back in high school in their physics class. A lot of it is that we talk about the end result and we don't talk enough about the human side of science. I mean, I think that 
For example, things like the Big Bang Theory TV show have done a great positive service because now people know what a theoretical physicist is right. and they didn't know before. And the more they know that physicists are just people trying to figure things out, the more interested they will be in the physics itself. All right, theoretical physicist Sean Carroll, thanks so much. Thank you.